It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Sagers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. That's right. It is the Thursday, September 1st edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And to start things off, of course, the show is powered by BetUS. That is where the game begins. Make sure that you go and sign up, BetUS.com. That is where you can get all of your sports gambling needs. Uh, Tons of great stuff. We'll probably have a promo code coming from them as far as deposits, etc. go uh, heading into the future. But for right now, just go ahead and sign up. There's a link in the description. Very easy to do. I'll also go ahead and tell you, make sure that you go and check out the BetUS College Football Show. Now, I do give a pick on here uh, where I talk about spreads that we did not discuss on that. But we talked about 16 different games on the BetUS College Football Show between Part 1 and Part 2 with myself and Parker Fleming, which if you're watching uh, on YouTube, you can see the banner right up there. So, Go ahead and check that out. Lots of fun. We uh, we have a good time. And we just did over 5,000 subscribers over there. So I will tell you this. Go ahead and subscribe to this channel as well. If you have not already, I would certainly appreciate that. Toss the follow link up on the site here, on the uh, page, on the screen, whatever it's called. But yes, uh, one of the wonderful things about being an independent podcast, independent show, whatever you want to call it, is that we can schedule this show to go out whenever we want it to, right? And today, as you can see, we are going out at 5 p.m. Central before all of the Thursday night games. So I'm not going to talk much about the Backyard Brawl. Already done that. We did that on the show the other day. Central Michigan, Oklahoma State. We talked about that on the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, If you want picks on that, if you want which way we're leaning, etc., go over there and check that one out. For sure. Penn State Purdue as well. I've got a pick on Penn State Purdue and I've got a pick on West Virginia and Pitt as well. Uh, but you you can find those over on the Bet US College Football Show. All right. Now, let's uh let's talk about some of these fun things that are going on in this crazy, crazy sport because my gosh, uh you it, yeah, we we might be to where, you know, there are what's the word I'm looking for? We, we are at game time. We are on a game day, the second college football game day of the season, and yet we continue to have realignment discussion, et cetera, media rights, all that other stuff that's going on in the background of the sport that will shape the landscape going into the future. So let's start off with this one here. Fox and ESPN have agreed to open negotiations early with the Big 12, even though Those talks were not set to begin until the beginning of 2024. Now, I do find this interesting because one of the reasons why, and that's not who I'm looking for, I'm looking for this. Uh, One of the reasons why the uh, Oklahoma and Texas move happened is because they were not happy with the fact that ESPN would not reopen negotiations with the Big 12 what, last summer, sometime around there, they the Big 12 wanted to make sure that they got plenty of money, et cetera, et cetera, and yet here we are a year later, and ESPN and Fox both have said, yeah, we'll go ahead and start this, because they understand that the landscape is shifting, and the Big 12 wants to get out ahead of the Pac-12. The Pac-12 opened their negotiations a little bit early, slightly earlier than the Big 12, but now everybody's going to be able to figure out exactly what the media rights are worth. Across the board. So the schools like Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah can figure out, hey, would it benefit us more to go over to the Big 12 or to stay in the Pac-12? You can figure those things out, and it's kind of the same thing with Washington and Oregon, et cetera, right? Which we're going to talk more about Washington here in just a minute. But I do find this surprising because it is so early. It's a year and a half early for the negotiations. And what this does is, you know, it moves it up, but it it allows the Big 12 to get an idea before the Pac-12 ever can get their contract done. So we will figure out the prices for these teams, and people are going to be able to make decisions. And that way, maybe a good part of this 
is that it gets done earlier so we don't have to continue talking about this, right? Like, it, it's still going to take a while for everything to happen, and these these rights are not going to go into effect for a little while. Uh, the issue with this is, you know, ESPN was not willing to reopen negotiations while Oklahoma and Texas were still in the Big 12, but now that Oklahoma and Texas have committed to joining the SEC, well, now ESPN might be wanting to get them uh, over to the SEC quicker because the SEC on CBS contract ends after next season, after the 2023 season. So I, I do think it is a smart idea for ESPN to go ahead and speed this thing up. That way maybe they can find a way to get CBS out of their contract, et cetera, for that last season. But yeah, let's let's go ahead and and talk about that right quick. Let's talk about Texas and Oklahoma moving over uh, possibly a year early in 2024, uh, or or possibly earlier. I don't think earlier, but, but we'll see. Uh, it says, you know, early exit for Oklahoma and Texas is being considered here, and I think it's smart uh, because you your TV contract is going to begin with the SEC only having 14 members if Oklahoma and Texas stay in their conference all the way through 2025, right, which marks the end of the college football playoff, which we're going to talk about that here in just a minute as well. But, yeah, it it does, like, it doesn't bind either side to this. Uh, it, this is a veteran media rights negotiator, which I would almost guarantee you is Bob Thompson. But it said it's a smart move for the Big 12. If you're the Big 12, why wouldn't you do this? It doesn't bind either side. Basically, you're just trying to get a number. Hey, what is our worth? And if you're wanting to make sure that all of the teams in the Big 12 stay on the same side, that, that you're all in lockstep, then you go ahead and get the numbers and make sure that if you're the Big 12, you're, you're not going to lose anybody else, right? You brought in four new faces. You got to figure out exactly what their media rights are worth, etc. cetera. Um, it says the Big 12 cannot engage bidders other than ESPN and Fox until 2024. I don't think you're going to get any other bidders. Like, you might be able to talk to some streaming services, etc., but if you want linear television, this is who you're talking to. CBS is not going to be... You're not going to CBS Sports Network, right? Because CBS already has their Game of the Week from the Big Ten. So you don't have to worry about that. NBC is only interested in Notre Dame and the Big Ten. So those are the other ones, right? It, other than that, you've got you got Fox and you got ESPN. And ESPN is, is partially ABC as well. It's all the Disney company. I look at this and I think about Oklahoma and Texas, and it makes a whole lot of sense for ESPN to want them out of that deal early. And if you're going ahead and talking to the Big 12, you can secure their rights or at least a, a portion of it, right, with Fox. And you can get Oklahoma and Texas to move over to the SEC early, go ahead and start that game of the week process earlier, and... And maybe if you're Fox, you find a way to make this beneficial for you as well. And that is actually going to move us into uh, the next part of this, which is, write my time down here. In order for all of this to make sense, for Oklahoma and Texas to leave early for ESPN, that benefits ESPN. It doesn't necessarily benefit the Big 12 right now unless a new contract can be started a little bit early with both ESPN and Fox. What doesn't benefit Fox for Oklahoma and Texas to jump off of their network with the Big 12 and join the SEC exclusively with ESPN unless you find a way to make some kind of a deal, right? And when you start talking about deals, then you start talking about this that Ross Dellinger reported on over at Sports Illustrated yesterday, and that is uh, sources say, Playoff expansion talks rejuvenated as key potential vote looms. University presidents are moving on discussions that could put expansion as early as 2024 back on the table. That is before the contract is done with ESPN. Right? There are four more years of contracts that are... Eh, not contracts. There are four more years on that ESPN contract. And that is... You know, it's a pretty big deal because the reason why this thing was voted against last year was a lot of people said it had to do with the non uh, or the exclusive negotiating rights that ESPN had at that point. 
right? The three big ones that voted against it, the only three that voted against the 12-team model that was presented were the Alliance, right? The Big Ten, the Pac-12, and the Big 12. Well, now everybody has come back out and said that they are in favor of an expanded playoff, but basically everybody has said, hey, we prefer this to be on multiple networks. That's where we can get the most money, etc. Well, if ESPN has the exclusive rights all the way through 2026, that doesn't benefit ESPN to get rid of it unless they are making it up by getting the Red River rivalry or the Red River shootout or whatever you want to call it. But if you're getting that, if you're getting Oklahoma against Florida, if you're getting Texas against Texas A&M, if you are getting Texas, Georgia, uh, Alabama, Oklahoma, you know, what matchups like that that will generate millions of views, if you're getting those on a regular basis, yeah, it might be okay for you to lose some playoff uh, content, right? That's the way that I'm seeing this. So, the way that this playoff expansion works, and I, I think it's going to get voted into. Um, now, it says in a scheduled virtual meeting on Friday, which is tomorrow, the CFP's highest-ranking governing body, the Board of Managers, is expected to chart the next course in playoff expansion by potentially holding a vote that, if unanimous, could open the path for expansion as early as 2024. Now, this is interesting because if they vote for this, that basically means that they have talked to ESPN and they have talked to Fox and whoever else about going ahead and splitting up a bunch of those playoff games. If you are moving to a 12-team model, you are adding additional weekends to this, right? Because 12 teams, you have two extra weekends. You're, you're basically tripling the field. So you're going to have two extra weekends. You will have 5 versus 12, 6 versus 11, uh, 7 versus 10, 8 versus 9 on that first weekend. Then the winners go and play the top four, and then the top... Uh, th- so those eight would drop down to four, which is what we have right now, which would drop down to the national championship game. You are creating a whole mess of new inventory. Well, if Fox can get their hands on that, that might make it a little bit easier for them to uh, let the Big 12 out of their contract so that Oklahoma and Texas can then move over to the SEC early so that the SEC deal can go ahead and begin. It, it's a whole mess of stuff, but it's it's all basically deals. How does this benefit everybody? Now, here is one, one issue that they may have problems with, and that is the, the CFP and Bill Hancock and, and all that bunch have already got their contracts in place for the sites that host the national title games in 2025 and 2026. So if that is the case... I, I'm I'm very interested, and, and obviously, this is all paperwork. You can find a way to get out of this. Somebody somebody will be willing to pay for it because it's going to generate a whole mess of, of more money, right? Just a lot more revenue for all these programs, for all these networks, for everybody that's involved in this, including the CFP. So, Yeah, I I think Fox uh, could get some of those playoff games, even though this is exclusively owned by ESPN all the way through 2026. I think ESPN would be willing to give up some of that to be able to get Oklahoma and Texas. And then the Big 12 would be willing to let them go early so that they can go ahead and get started on their new deal, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because they might be able to poach some of those Pac-12. It's all aligned. It all makes sense. If you just follow the tea leaves, right? <laughs> that's that's the way that this goes. So uh, we will jump off of that. And my gosh, I hope we don't have to talk about it every week. But you know, the way it's going, it might. It, it really might. I mean, we're talking about generating uh, another $450 million in gross revenue uh, over the extra two years there. I think it might be more than that, honestly. I think there would be a lot of people interested in this. I am not here to debate, at least not right now, whether or not we should expand. I've already given my thoughts on it. At one point, I was a four and no more kind of guy, and then I was, hey, we need to go all the way up to 16, and now I can be swayed on either side because I don't know. I really I have no idea how this will affect things. I'm worried about the regular season for sure, but regardless, we'll move on from there. Washington is in Chicago, or at least their reps were in Chicago, meeting with the Big Ten. 
about expansion. Now, Oregon just did this not that long ago. I think the Big Ten is doing their due diligence to make sure that they understand exactly what is going on with uh, everything, right? Right. Uh, you want to see uh, whether or not it, you want to see what Washington brings to the table. How do they fit? And, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about Nate Silver ranking everybody based on uh, fit and culture and media and market size and et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious about all of it. I, I want to know more. I want to see what is actually happening. Uh, this was an article over at the Action Network. Brett McMurphy is the one that actually got the, um, he actually got the information on this. Uh, it says Washington is the latest Pac-12 school that has conducted preliminary discussions with the Big Ten about joining the conference, sources told Action Network. Uh, and yeah, I guess it was last week that Oregon had the same discussions. Uh, these meetings did not involve university presidents or Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren, same as Oregon. Uh, the meetings were conducted with lawyers and consultants representing the schools and the Big Ten to determine the school's compatibility with the league. It is among the first steps a potential new member must take to join the Big Ten. Now, this is... I think Washington would be a good fit. But really what we're doing here is trying to find travel partners for USC and UCLA. Do I think it's smart? Yeah, I think so. Because you can't just have two members of your conference that are all the way across the country with no additional teams, no other market share on that coast. It makes no sense, neither logistically or logically or monetarily or anything to just have two outsiders that are considered part of your conference. Uh, so, yeah, getting at least two other schools from the West Coast would make the most sense. Uh, but we, we're not there yet. So the Big Ten wants to make sure that they're getting the right ones. USC and UCLA are massive brands. And, yes, while Washington and Oregon are big brands, are they the best fit? Are they exactly what you want coming into the Big Ten? Uh, because there's also Stanford and there's Cal and there's just a ton of other opportunities that you're going to want to go through and do your due diligence to make sure that you got the right places. Do you align politically? Do you align with all these other things? Because you brought in USC and UCLA, and we remember what California was like during the pandemic. If something along those lines happens again, you got to make sure that everybody's on the same page so that you don't get into these shouting matches. Right? That's what we're looking for. So, all right. Uh, here's one thing that could slow this thing down, by the way. And we'll go ahead and pull this thing up. But Ohio State, it appears, could be against more expansion. Uh, now, this, of course, an article over on Stanford's uh, Fan Nation page, part of the uh, Sports Illustrated slew of pages, and I forget the name of that company, but regardless, uh, it says, Ohio State reportedly against the Big Ten expanding more. Could Ohio State's being against expansion buy the Pac-12 more time and allow for them to expand? Well, John Wilner is the one that posted this, and he did it on Twitter. He said, line movement, Pac-12 survival, now a five-point favorite over extinction, up from four and a half. He said, the reason chances of more Big Ten expansion this cycle have diminished we do not believe Ohio State supports additional moves, and that is a big vote against. Now, do I believe that Ohio State probably doesn't want more expansion? Right now, maybe. Uh, you don't want more trips to the West Coast if you don't have to, etc. But I think that Ohio State being against it doesn't necessarily matter because Kevin Warren has let it be known that he expects this thing to get bigger and he expects the Big Ten to get bigger, and he expects them to basically encapsulate the entire uh, United States. He wants all of it. He wants the late-night windows as well. He wants as much as he possibly can get, and Ohio State uh, was perfectly fine with being the big dog, doing their thing with the 14 teams that they already had. The, the two teams that were brought in for the last round of expansion about a decade ago were Maryland and Rutgers, and neither of them poses any kind of a threat to Ohio State. You bring in USC, you bring in the team that beat Ohio State last year uh, in Oregon. 
I mean, like, what are we, what are we talking about here? Ohio State then has a little bit more competition, but it, it's not even necessarily that. There's travel. There's all kinds of stuff that, yeah, Ohio State's probably cool with making a trip to L.A. every now and then, but does Ohio State want to go to Eugene, Oregon? Probably not. Do they want to go to Seattle? Eh, probably not. You're not going to get a ton of players from out there anyway. Uh, you will get players from L.A. So, if, yeah, if I'm Ohio State, I'm probably against it. I don't think it necessarily matters, though, because this situation is Kevin Warren. And while, yes, you are going to have to have all these guys vote to bring in new partners, new schools, I think everybody's going to end up on the same page, especially when you start seeing the paychecks, right? I think that's the biggest thing. You bring in these other schools, somehow these networks find a way to uh, bump up that paycheck just a little bit more. Yeah, I think Ohio State would get in line pretty, pretty quick. Uh, although, I do think if everybody had their way, they might wish this thing would go back to the way that it was back when the Big Ten had 10 teams, you know, all that good stuff. So, interesting stuff for sure. Let's go ahead and jump out of this. We'll hit some ads and then. We are going to talk a little preview for week one after this. Let's check out some things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now... Back to the show. All right, let's talk about week one. And before we do that, we're, we're going to start this thing off by discussing this. And I'm going to do it every single week. So I hope you're ready. Where is ESPN's college game day going in week two? Now, they have not announced it, but of course, there have been a couple of leaks and whatnot. And by looking at the schedule, there's not a ton of options for next week. But we always like to talk about it. We, we like to chop this thing up. And there are people that are wanting to what? The situation. So we will go ahead and pull up the schedule for next week, looking at the ESPN scoreboard. And of course, the first game on the docket there, it is a Fox game, but Alabama heads to Texas. Now, this is this would be only the second time that they have gone to Austin since the 2009 season. So more than a decade, they've only had one stop over there, and that was 2019 when LSU went to Austin. Uh, you know, Joe Burrow, all that good stuff. And it was also in week two of the season, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, but only once since 2009, yeah, they are probably going to be in Austin for a game that's on Fox. Uh, Reese Davis has let it be known, like, they are still going to go to Big Ten games, even if ESPN has no Big Ten games on their networks, because they're going to go where the story is. And there are a ton of storylines with this. Steve Sarkeesian was the OC at Alabama under Nick Saban. Uh, there's a bunch of transfers that went from Alabama to Texas. Of course, Quinn Ewers wins the starting job, etc. The only way that they don't go to this game is if somehow... Utah State or Louisiana Monroe pulls off upsets over one of these two in week one. I don't foresee that happening. Both are uh, upper 30-point favorites. Uh, Alabama, they're over a 40-point favorite. I don't foresee those happening. But you never know, so we got to toss out the pop, uh, the possibility, I guess. Uh, other than that, like Baylor at BYU, it is a late, late game, but that one is on ESPN. Um, you scroll all the way down, and... Yeah, I mean, that's an ESPN game at 9.15 p.m. Central Time. Maybe that works. It's a top 25 team against a top 10 team. Of course, that could be crushed if BYU were to go and lose this weekend at South Florida. Uh, USC at Stanford maybe could be interesting because there is a storyline there. Stanford, of course, the team that beat USC last year that got uh, uh, Clay Helton fired. Oh, I wanted to say Chip Kelly. Not, not, not that one. Uh, there's also Tennessee at Pitt next week and Kentucky at Florida. Eh, Alabama at Texas seems to be the storyline. So that is the way that I'm going to go on that one. So Alabama at Texas is where I believe game day will head in week number two. Now, 
Let's move on to our CFB Week 1 preview. And what I do here is I basically ask the same questions every week, but I go through, I've already given you the, or I've already given you the viewing guide for the week, but here is what we're rolling with, okay? For the CFB Week 1 preview, my first question here is, which games are going to get the highest ratings? Yes, there is a huge faction of the public that likes to know what the TV ratings are and whatnot, because there are a lot of people, myself included, that believe that TV ratings maybe play a part in who gets into the college football playoff. Well, uh, you look at this, Ohio State-Notre Dame is probably going to be your most watched game of the weekend. I don't know that it's going to be close. Maybe it'll be close if Georgia and Oregon ends up being a close game. I mean, we're talking exciting plays, all that kind of stuff that can somehow get uh, people over to that channel. But that is the same channel as Ohio State and Notre Dame, and it's, you know, one leads into the other one. I think Ohio State Notre Dame is going to be the biggest. Sunday night, standalone window, Florida State and the LSU in the Superdome in New Orleans. That could be interesting because it is two big-time brands, but I do believe a lot of the shine has come off of those teams because they have not been as good as of late. So, uh, Ohio State Notre Dame, top five matchup. Yeah, obviously, I think it's going to be a huge deal. Utah at Florida could draw a pretty significant number on ESPN. And Cincinnati at Arkansas is also on ESPN. Cincinnati, of course, a playoff team last year. Arkansas, uh, a lot of people fired up about what Sam Pittman did last season and whether or not he can continue it. So, uh, as far as who will get the biggest ratings, it's Ohio State-Notre Dame. And I don't know that it's necessarily close. Uh, The most exciting games, basically the game that's going to have the closest score or like the the most explosive plays, etc. Most exciting games for this week. I got Utah at Florida as being pretty exciting. I want to see what Anthony Richardson looks like in this offense with Billy Napier. I think it's going to be fantastic. Utah going down to the Swamp Saturday night, 50 to 60% chance of rain. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see how they hold up in that environment uh, and really what Florida looks like under Billy Napier. Like, will they be considerably, uh, considerably more organized than they were under Dan Mullen? That's what I'm looking for. Houston at UTSA, I think it's going to be just an absolute banger. You're going to see a ton of explosive plays in this. Both of these offenses like to go deep. They like to go uh, maybe run some some trick stuff, etc., to find ways to get the ball into the end zone. Army at Coastal, yeah, this one might be a really quick game because of all of the running that's going to happen. Coastal runs the ball over 60% of the time. And, of course, you know what Army does with the triple option. But... I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to be able to see Grayson McCall, who, I mean, mullet-wearing quarterback, who talked about piss and teal and everything else. I, I, I can't wait to see that one. It's on ESPN+. Plus. And North Carolina at App State. Now, this is an in-state rivalry. Rivalry, I guess. And North Carolina fans might get mad at me for calling it that. But uh, to me, this is a very interesting situation because North Carolina has not been as good, but they have certainly got more talent than App State. App State's got the better culture. They are at home, and getting a team like this in their home stadium is going to be awesome. So I'm excited for that one. What teams have the most to gain or the most to lose? Well, we'll start off with the most to lose, and I think Utah does. Utah is a kind of sleeper playoff pick. Uh, everybody's picking them to win the Pac-12, etc. And even if they lose this game, yeah, you can still do all of those things. If you lose at Florida, you can still make it to the playoff. You can still do whatever. But you have no safety net at that point. So, for me, Utah is the most to lose. After that, it's Houston. You know, Houston, in-state, uh, tons of stuff. UTSA, of course, building a brand here. But this is the year that Houston is supposed to be really, really good. Senior quarterback in Clayton Toon, they have worked and worked for this season. Uh, Last year, maybe a year early, or at least they thought, but they have to go on the road to the Alamo Dome in week one. Yeah, that's not going to look good for in-state recruiting, etc. if you go out and lose that game, for sure. Uh, After that, Ohio State, again, this is the year. Uh, Ryan Day said it himself, 11-2 and is not a good season at Ohio State. They want to be holding up a trophy at the end of the season, and it makes it that much more difficult if you were to lose at home to a Notre Dame team that has a first-year head coach and a Notre Dame team that has not been able to beat playoff com- uh, competent, playoff competitive contenders. <laughs> maybe that's what I'm looking for. Maybe that's the maybe that's the right word. Uh, the other most to lose I got on here is Penn State. Like, yes, I know that you're going on the road, and Purdue is dangerous. 
you are Penn State. You are supposed to beat Purdue. And so, don't, don't make this too hard, James Franklin. Uh, the most to gain, Notre Dame, for sure. Uh, we already went through all that. I mean, they, they have never been able to beat a playoff contender. Uh, Syracuse. Syracuse hosting Louisville. Like, I think they've got a ton to gain in this one. You get started off with a win in that matchup. And, yeah, you are on the right foot to make it to a bowl game, maybe save Dino Baber's job. Curious about Robert and I, the new offense coordinator. He brought over Jason Beck with him, the quarterback's coach. Uh, as far as most to gain, my last one here, Purdue against Penn State. I brought up Penn State the most to lose. Well, Purdue has the most to gain at home. I mean, you're looking at if they win this game, they may go undefeated all the way late into October. I mean, it is the schedule eases up for them quite a bit before they get to the back half. So, a lot to gain with this one. You lose this, uh, people probably don't pay attention to you for the next month and a half. You win this one, I mean, you start moving up those rankings a little bit. Uh, you're starting to build some momentum, as they would say. All right, the most likely 10-plus point underdog outright winner. What 10-plus point dog can win a game outright this weekend? Now, I've got three of them. I don't know that I believe in any of them. Uh, the first one that I've got here, East Carolina, plus 340. They're like an 11.5-point dog at home to NC State. If you get North Carolina State to turn the ball over, if you get them to play outside of their comfort zone, etc., uh, yeah, maybe there's a way that you could make this happen. Because Greenville has, in the past, found ways to rise up a little bit of the fan support and get everybody really excited. But I'll, I'll tell you this. These two teams played in 2018 and 2019, and NC State beat them by a combined 92-9. to I mean, they just beat them to death. Now, this looks like a different program under Mike Houston, but uh, but I don't I don't know that Holton Aylers is, is a great quarterback. I think he doesn't do well under pressure, and he is going to be pressured a lot by that NC State defense. Or NC State defense. So, um, and so I, I don't know that I buy it, but, you know, East Carolina plus 340, it's not outside the realm of possibilities. For sure. Uh, Georgia State is a 12.5 or 13-point dog to South Carolina. Okay, you know, South Carolina in the past, like last year for sure, et cetera, like a couple of years ago under Will Muschamp, all that, maybe. I mean, we did see Troy go in and beat them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, No, 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 I think it was App State that beat them. But Georgia State, you know, does return a lot of players, et cetera. But, again, looking at this talent-wise, uh, the game is at South Carolina at night. Spencer Rattler's debut for them. They got a ton of big time new weapons, et cetera. And that's the tricky part, right? You got new weapons in Marcus Satterfield's offense. You're trying to figure things out. Uh, maybe Georgia State can find a way to keep the ball on the ground, get some turnovers, you know, all that good stuff. But to me, no, no, no. I, I do think that South Carolina is going to win this game. Uh, but is it outside of the realm of possibilities? No. So Georgia State on that one. And finally, North Texas at home against SMU. The line opened seven. It's been bet up to SMU minus 11. Uh, North Texas had some holes. But again, North Texas is coming back home. Uh, SMU playing their first game under under a brand-new head coach as well. You know, Seth Luttrell at North Texas has been there for quite some time. And Phil Bennett maybe could figure out a way to slow down Rhett Lashley's offense. Maybe. I don't necessarily buy into any of these, but these are the ones that I think are the most likely double-digit underdog outright winners. So, uh, we'll close the other part of the preview with this. G5 game of the week. I think it's Houston at UTSA. I think that's the one. Um, you can you can talk Army at Coastal, maybe. You might be able to talk me into that. You might could talk me into Liberty at Southern Miss. You know, Charlie Brewer's debut for Hugh Freeze and Will Hall with his second season Actually having a quarterback this year would certainly help things. Uh, I think Hattiesburg is going to be bananas. I think that uh, Conway, South Carolina, is going to be pretty awesome over there in Myrtle Beach. But I do think that the Alamo Dome is going to be rocking for an in-state matchup between Houston and UTSA. Already talked about it. I think it's going to be a huge, huge atmosphere. So I am, uh, I am going to move off of this one. Uh, let's go ahead and hit some ads, and then we are moving to our Against the Spread pick em for week one. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at GaryWCE. You can also follow on Facebook. 
Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, college football, week one, under the radar, against the spread, pick them. I am excited about this. We have 12 games that were not discussed on the Bet U.S. College Football Show. If you have not already, make sure that you go and watch those two shows. We did one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. Uh, they are doing massive numbers right now, so we certainly appreciate all you guys that are watching. Make sure you subscribe over on that channel. And, uh, by the way, jump into our picks contest. Uh, giving away a $25 Amazon gift card every single week to whoever ends up winning this thing. You can go over to the website, winningcureseverything.com, and enter the contest there. It's only for Saturday games, so the deadline will be at 11 a.m. Central Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday morning. Get your picks in, maybe win you some money. Uh, I think I think it's a good time for all. So go ahead and knock that thing out. But yes, oh, that is brought to you by BetUS. By the way, all of these lines that I'm going to give you Brought to you by BetUS. So go ahead and make sure that you've got yourself in over there. We will start off with this one here. TCU going to Colorado on a Friday night. And I, I'm excited about this. It is the debut of Sonny Dykes at TCU. Got a lot of quarterbacks he can be playing. Quentin Johnson, of course, the wide receiver, is an absolute stud. I can't wait to watch him play. Uh, the line sits at 13 and a half in favor of TCU on the road. Total is 57. It's a 10 p.m. Eastern time game on ESPN. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I will take TCU. Now, I also like the idea of taking the TCU over. This is the debut. Sonny Dykes likes to come out and put on a show. And I do not like Colorado's roster at all. Like, I like Carl Durrell. I like what he tried to do there. But that roster has gotten significantly worse year over year. And... I don't know how he rebuilt it. I don't see... I mean, this team has a win total of three. I don't think they're even going to get close to that. So, I... If I don't think they're going to get close, TCU under two touchdowns, like, I think they're going to have a ton of explosive plays. I think you're going to see some fun stuff from Sonny Dykes. Uh, not all of it, because I don't think he's going to have to open up the entire playbook, but I do think that you're going to see uh, at least a couple of different quarterbacks, if not all three, that he's got... And I think they're all going to play well because I think that they can all fit into Sonny Dykes' offense. I mean, this is a fantastic, fantastic offensive football team just based on last year. I don't even think they knew what to do with all the parts that they had last year. And now you've got a guy that is offense first. Yeah, and Joe Gillespie, of course, the Tulsa D.C. coming in, going off against Colorado's offense. Oh, yeah, give me a little bit. Give me a little bit on that one. So, Yes, uh, I will take TCU to cover the 13 and a half there. North Carolina heads to App State on Saturday morning, and this is another one that I'm pretty excited about. In-state game, I've talked about it a little bit in the preview, but I am excited about this because I really like North Carolina. I like their talent here. Uh, they are a one-point favorite on the road. This has bounced all over the place. North Carolina was originally favored by three, and then it jumps back. App State, because of how bad North Carolina looked against Florida A&M last week, uh, it bounced back to App State being a one- or two-point favorite this week. It's bounced back across. North Carolina is now the favorite. Uh, look, it's going to be a wild atmosphere. It's an ESPNU game. It's at 12 p.m. Eastern time. I, the reason I like North Carolina here is I don't think they cared at all about that Florida A&M game. I don't think they put anything on film. I don't think that their defense did anything different. I think they were just getting in and then getting out of Dodge. I think that's it. They didn't care one iota about that football game. Do I think that Gene Chizik is a great defense coordinator? I think he used to be. I don't know that he is now, but I don't know that you have to be to be able to beat App State. 
the roster difference here is massive between these two. Like, I really think that North Carolina is significantly more talented. Does App State have the better the better culture? Yeah, probably. I, I like what they've built there. But I, I cannot get it out of my head how fired up App State was back in, like, 2017 when Miami came in to Boone and just absolutely shellacked them. And it wasn't even a great Miami team. So, uh, 2016 or 2017 or whatever it was, okay, yeah, Miami was okay at that point, but they were not world beaters by any stretch of the imagination. And App State was fired up. They had looked really good so far that season. They were getting a team at home, and I think they got beat 40, 45 to 17 or 52 to whatever it was. I mean, it was a thorough shellacking. North Carolina has a roster full of dudes. I think they will go out and be able to play. So I'm going to take North Carolina to cover the one here. Colorado State heads to Michigan. Now, this is not exactly a thrilling football game, but Michigan favored by 30 and a half here. Uh, 61 and a half is the total. Of course, if anybody watched Brad Powers uh, over on covers, I mean, as soon as he gave out that over, that line jumped three points immediately. It was 58. It's jumped up to 61 and a half. Uh, it's 12 p.m. on 12 p.m. Eastern Saturday on ABC, but we do get to see Cade McNamara be the starter again. He's going to start Game One just like he did the majority of last season. Actually, I think every game last season, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm going to take Michigan to cover 30 and a half. Now, my numbers say that this should be about 34. Uh, Colorado State, of course, new head coach Jay Norvell. Uh, lots of things to like about the direction that Colorado State is going, but this is Game One with a new regime and a ton of transfers, a lot of which played for him at Nevada. But, eh, I'm, I'm going to side with Michigan, who likes to run it up a little bit at home. They, they are not afraid of scoring points in their home arena, and I don't think that Colorado State is going to be able to put up a ton of points, not to mention the fact that I think Michigan's offense is going to get a lot more possessions because the way that Norvell's team likes to play They like to throw the ball quite a bit. I I think you could see several three and outs against that Michigan defense. So I I do think that Michigan can cover 30 and a half on that one. Arizona is heading to San Diego State on Saturday. The game is on CBS. It is a 3.30 p.m. Eastern time kick. Of course, CBS using their Mountain West Conference tie-in to put San Diego State on and I wonder if they regret it a little bit with all the, the off-field stuff going on around there. But regardless, we'll, we'll stay off of that. San Diego State is a 6.5-point favorite here. The total is pretty low, 46.5. Since I'm only picking sides here, I'm not going to worry about the total. I'm going to talk to you about the idea that San Diego State maybe did not fix their quarterback situation by bringing in Braxton Burmeister from Virginia Tech. He did not play well as a quarterback for guys that are good on offense, right? Justin Fuente used to know exactly what he was doing with quarterbacks, but he did not do so well at Virginia Tech with Braxton Burmeister. I don't think him going over to San Diego State, a team that has relied on its defense for quite some time, is going to fix anything for him, and I don't think it's going to fix anything for San Diego State's offense. I do not trust the Aztecs to be able to score the football unless somebody gives them the ball. And Arizona did that a couple of times last year, right? Um... Arizona brings in Jaden DeLora, the quarterback from Washington State, and they bring in uh, a transfer, Jacob Cowing, the wide receiver from UTEP, who was a top 10 PPA player for last season in all of FBS. He was the UTEP offense last year, and Jacob Cowing is phenomenal. Arizona's offensive line has three dudes that all weigh over 300 pounds. They are huge. I mean, just big old boys. I think they're going to have success against San Diego State. San Diego State without Cam Johnson, uh, or Cam Thomas, excuse me, of course, who led them in tackles for loss last year. Yeah, they've got some other guys that really know what they're doing. They have studs on defense. Again, I think all it's going to take for Arizona to be able to stay in this game is a couple of explosive plays from that passing attack. And I again, I like what Jed Fish is doing with this roster. Like, they covered quite a few times last year when they maybe shouldn't have. They might have had some turnover luck, et cetera. But I think they got quarterback figured out. I think they got some playmakers on this team. I think they're building something here. 
And yes, even though it is the grand opening of Snapdragon Stadium for San Diego State, maybe there's some distraction going on with the off-field stuff around that program. Maybe, uh, maybe that defense lost a little bit with some of the guys that they lost. And on offense, uh, all the studs that they had last year, Greg Bell and the, the tight end, Daniel, I forget it, uh, Bellin, Bellinger, maybe, uh, those guys are gone. They, they either graduated or went to the NFL. So I, I don't trust San Diego State to score, and if I'm not going to get a ton of points out of them, I only need really a couple of touchdowns from Arizona, maybe maybe 17 points, and I can keep this thing within 6.5. Yeah, give me Arizona plus 6.5 on this one for sure. Moving on from there, Tennessee at, excuse me, I'm not going to worry with Tennessee. Troy heads to Oxford, Mississippi to take on Ole Miss. Ole Miss a 21-and-a-half point uh, favorite right now. That's the current line over at BetUS. Total sits at 57-and-a-half. It's uh, Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern on the SEC Network. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I kind of like Troy a little bit here. My line has this as Troy uh, as an 18-point underdog here. So that is a little bit different. Uh, It's... 21 and a half. I mean, I'm getting over three touchdowns. Ole Miss is still trying to figure out their quarterback situation. They have a ton of new pieces. They are all super talented. But I'm going to tell you, I don't trust their defense very much. And while I do like their offensive pieces, Troy has a top 15 roster on defense. Like, their offense is not all that great. But John Summerall knows what he's doing on defense. I mean, he came over from Kentucky as their co-defense coordinator. But also... I think that what he's got at Troy is just an uber-talented defense that can give Ole Miss some trouble. I, I, I trust Troy in this situation to keep this under three touchdowns. I will take the Trojans plus 21 and a half for sure. For sure on that one. You guys let me know what you think as well. I want to know what your picks are on this. So, we'll move along. BYU. BYU heads to South Florida and the current line at BetUS is South Florida as an 11.5-point home dog. Total sits at 58.5, 4 p.m. Eastern time on ESPNU. And there's some rumblings that the top two wide receivers for BYU are probable for this game, et cetera. I mean, nobody has explicitly said that they are out, but it does make you pause a little bit, right? I, I've... I've got BYU winning 10 games this year, so obviously I want them to do well. But, uh, you know, Gary Bohannon, the quarterback from Baylor that actually had a lot of success against BYU last season at Baylor, uh, he is now the starting quarterback at South Florida, and Jeff Scott's bunch seemed to do really, really well against the spread against ranked opponents last year at home. So I think they were 4-0 and against the spread at home. Now, they didn't win a bunch of those, and this is a shorter line than some of those that he got before. But, I mean, they were right in that game against Cincinnati. They were, I mean, they did some good things. The talent level is up there. I'm going to go ahead and take South Florida here to cover 11 and a half. I, I love BYU. I love what they're bringing back. I mean, they have got a ton of returning production, et cetera. I like Jaron Hall, the quarterback. This one could get tricky. You know, again, this is one of those uh, mid-afternoon games in Florida. Uh, it gets a little... A little tricky. The humidity could be a little crazy for BYU. Maybe they start off a little slow, pull away later. Uh, but I could totally see BYU been winning by like 10 points uh, because they decide, hey, if we don't have our top two wide receivers or if they're a little hobbled or whatever, uh, then maybe we're just going to run the ball a lot and get out of there with a win. I could totally, totally see that happening. So I will take South Florida to cover 11 and a half on that one. Army heads to Conway, South Carolina, to Myrtle Beach, to fight the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers on the teal field. Now, Coastal is a two-point favorite here, total of 53-and-a-half. This one's at 7 p.m. Eastern time on on ESPN+. And I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this game. I think... I'm going to go with Coastal because I think they're more explosive. I don't like the situation with Army here. They lost Christian Anderson. They lost Jabari Laws, the two quarterbacks that they had the most success with last season. Uh, The other guys that they had on the roster really did not do well when they were asked to throw the football. 
Uh, and again, it's Army, so I don't expect them to throw the ball much at all. But there, there was not a lot of success coming when those other guys were behind center. In this situation, yeah, I know that there's not a lot of returning production for Coastal Carolina, but if you still got Grayson McCall at quarterback and you still got uh, Jamie Chadwell calling that offense, I think you have more chances for some explosive plays out of Coastal Carolina than you do out of Army. And I'm going to take that. I'm going to take Coastal at less than a field goal here at home. I, I think they're the overall better team, especially with the better quarterback. So, so give me that one uh, for you know, the teal field. <laughs> I, will, I will go with the better quarterback. I will go with an interesting coach. That's an interesting offensive matchup, by the way, as far as the schemes go. Because uh, Jamie Chadwell runs something that is not unlike what the triple option is that Jeff Munkin is running. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen. But yeah, I'm going to take Coastal to cover the two on that one. Memphis heads to Starkville, Mississippi to face off against Mississippi State. And the Bulldogs are a 16-point favorite in year three under Mike Leach here. The total sits at 57. Uh, it's Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPNU. So, not a primetime spot, but regardless. Uh, Memphis is 0-9 against the spread on the road under Ryan Silverfield. And while this does seem like a ton of points, at Mississippi State is still mad about the way that that game ended last year in the Liberty Bowl. Remember, it was a 31-29 to game that, you know, uh, Memphis... I'm not going to say had no business winning, but Mississippi State doubled them up on yardage last year. I mean, it was over 400 yards to like 200 yards for Memphis. And you had a kind of fluky punt return touchdown that maybe should have been ruled down. Uh, just a lot of, lot of different ways that Mississippi State lost that game. Will Rogers in his third season, I think the offense is going to be ridiculous. Uh, this is, I think this is going to be a really good year for Mississippi State. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about a ton of NFL talent on this state roster, just undervalued, under underappreciated, right? And I think they're probably right because you, have, I mean, the average age of the dudes on this Mississippi State roster is like 21 and a half. I mean, you got some old guys on this roster that have been around for a long time that are now heading into their third season with Mike Leach, and I'm gonna I'm gonna roll with the Pirate. I know it's 16 points, but I'm I'm going to take Mississippi State in this spot to cover 16 because I don't trust Memphis right now. Now, could Seth Hennigan, the first, or the I guess now true sophomore quarterback, uh, do some amazing things for him? Yeah, but I don't know that I trust a bunch of the playmakers. Uh, I think Memphis will score some. I think Mississippi State will score more. So I will ride with State to cover 16 on that. We will stick in the SEC, and we're going to move 82 miles to the east, and we are going to talk about uh, Utah State going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and Alabama currently a 41.5-point favorite at home. This opened around 37 and has now bounced all the way up to, it was at 42.5 at one point. There was some my back on that one. Uh, 62.5 is the total. This is a 7.30 p.m. Eastern time kick on SEC Network. I... Obviously, I think Alabama is going to win the game. I don't think that's hard to predict, especially when the team is up, you know, is a forty-something point favorite. But I don't think that you saw the Utah State last week that you will see this week. I think they came out against UConn and maybe expected UConn to lay down, or they didn't exactly know what to expect from UConn, etc. I think that Utah State will put up a little bit more of a fight in this game. They did get out of. Uh, their home stadium with a win over UConn last week, although it was not impressive, 31-20. to But again, that was the North Carolina situation. I don't think they cared anything about that game. They knew they could do whatever they needed to do and get out of there with a win, try a few things here and there. But I, you know, I liked some of the pieces that they've got, et cetera. I don't think that Alabama is going to shut these guys out. Uh, but it, could I see something along the lines of, you know, before Alabama goes to Texas, do they get up really big early? And then try and play a bunch of guys and develop that depth? Yeah, I think so, because they play in Austin next week. I'm going to take Utah State to cover the 41-and-a-half. It's a very terrifying proposition because we have seen Alabama just demolish some teams before, but I think Utah State is a little bit better than what they showed last week, and I think that line should be closer to what it was, about 37-and-a-half, 38. 
Uh, so you give me about three and a half points of uh, of an advantage, and I will feel good about that one. Boise State is going to Corvallis on Saturday night. And I'm excited about this. Uh, facing off against the Oregon State Beavers, Oregon State is a two-and-a-half point favorite here, total of 57 it's a 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time late, late kick on ESPN. And Boise State was not great in certain situations last year. Uh, of course, the first game of the year at UCF, just a complete disaster with all the delays and everything else. It was a Thursday night. Uh, they got up big, and then UCF came back, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, Andy Avalos, I think, needs to have a good year this year. Jonathan Smith and what he has done at Oregon State has been incredibly impressive. And look, Oregon State was undefeated against the spread at home last year. But also, they have not covered a week one game or their opening game under Jonathan, uh, under Jonathan Smith. I, I have found it very interesting on which side to go with here. I don't know that I necessarily trust Boise State's offense. Um, I do trust their defense. I think year two under Andy Avalos is going to be a big, big deal because he is a defensive guy. Uh, but I also think, you know, they had quite a few injuries, et cetera. They lose uh, their top wide receiver. I, I still think Boise will be able to kind of manhandle these guys. And I will I will take Boise to uh, cover the two and a half. And I think they can probably win the game in Corvallis. I, I like this line a lot more when it was at three. But uh, I had this closer to a pick em, even in Corvallis. And and I'm going to take Boise to cover two and a half. So I, I do think that the Broncos are a lot of fun. At Jonathan Smith and what he's done at Oregon State is really interesting. But And I do think they're going to be pretty good again this year. But they lose some pieces, and I'm curious to see which way they go. I think Boise State is a really, really fun, good football team. So I will ride with the Broncos. Moving on from there. Kent State heads to Washington, heads to Seattle, and the Huskies are 23-point favorites here. The total sits at 59.5. And, And yeah, this one's Saturday, 10.30 p.m. on FS1. Uh, There's a lot of people, you know, taking their their chances and and whatnot, putting a little money line sprinkle on Kent State to beat Washington because of how bad they were last year, etc. I will tell you this. Kalen DeBoer is a fantastic football coach. He was Michael Penix's offensive coordinator at Indiana. Penix, of course, has transferred over. He is the starting quarterback for the Huskies. He appears to be healthy. And that Huskies team has talent. They have got a bunch of talent to work with. I think that they are going to be pretty good this year, like just right off the bat. You know, they they got some transfers in there, and they already had talent there. I think that this team is going to be raring to go and even as bad as they were last year, they were still able to throttle uh, some not great G5 competition with Arkansas State, etc. Kent State, I believe, is number 109 in the country in returning production, and the majority of that was on offense. So, let's see. I'm going to pull that up right now. Kent State, number 109 returning production, only 53% returning production only 42% returning production on offense. Now, they do have Marquez Cooper, uh, the running back, coming back. They do have uh, Dante Cephas, the uh, the wide receiver, coming back as well. Like, they they got some dudes, but, oh, I do not think that they line up well at all with, uh, with Washington on this. Uh, if you look at what Kent State was able to do for Sean Lewis against, you know, teams like uh, Texas A&M and... Even even Maryland last year, et cetera. Like teams that would not just maul you to death. Uh, they were not great when going up against big time competition. I think that they use these games not only as a paycheck, but also as a way to uh, try out some new things. We'll say that. Last year, 2021, uh, they had a pretty ridiculous non conference schedule. They played at Texas AM, lost by 31. They played at Iowa, and they lost by 23. They played at Maryland, and they lost by 21. I think Washington is better than Maryland. I think Washington, with this new offense, is probably better than Iowa. I don't expect Kent State to score a lot. I expect Washington to show off a lot of their new toys. So I'm going to ride with Washington to cover that 23. Uh, Kent State normally doesn't put up much of a fight in games like these. So I will uh, I will certainly take the Huskies on that one. Last one that we will hit for today, it is the Monday night game. 
And I'm excited about it uh, because I'm excited about all football games this weekend. It's week one. It's going to be a good time. We've got Clemson heading to Georgia Tech, and this one is being played at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, not at the home field of Virginia Tech. I mean, of, uh, of Georgia Tech, excuse me. Like, that, that's the crazy part about this. Like, you, you've got a conference game. Do not take these games and put them over into what is effectively a neutral site. Like, that's just ridiculous. So, uh, Georgia Tech is a 2020, maybe if I can talk to in the show, at Georgia Tech is a 22-point underdog at home. Total of 51. Uh, it's 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday night on ESPN. Standalone window. Going to be a good time. I Do I believe in Clemson a whole lot right now? No. But I'm still going to take them to cover this 22. Okay? Uh, changing over the coordinators I think could be very tricky. Also... I think that Dabo Sweeney does not like Jeff Collins. They had a dispute a couple of years or a few years ago, however long ago it was, that first year for Jeff Collins. I think Dabo could see this as an opportunity to maybe knock Jeff Collins out of this job, and I don't think he's going to pull off the gas. Uh, you got a healthy team this go round. Clemson was not healthy when this game was fourteen to eight last year in Clemson. I think full offensive line, full defense. I mean, these defensive ends are not going to stop. That defensive line is going to continue to wreak havoc on that offensive line for Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech had a bunch of guys lose or leave out of the transfer portal. I don't trust any of the ones that came in. I This is just a sad situation in Atlanta, for sure. I think Clemson could absolutely demolish them and still not be very good on offense. I will certainly say that. I don't think they have to be good on offense to be able to win this by more than 22. Uh, you kind of saw that last year when Clemson beat up on South Carolina. right? Once they got healthy at the end of the year, South Carolina was a pretty good, competent football team, and they beat them 30 to nothing. So in this one, I'm only giving up 22, and I have a feeling that that stadium, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium there, is going to be probably half and half Clemson Georgia Tech fans, if not more Clemson fans. Yeah. Give me the Tigers here. I, I, I don't know that I trust the new coordinators a whole lot. I don't think I have to. I think Clemson has got a ridiculously uh, big advantage as far as the roster goes, at, at, at the line of scrimmage, at everything, really. So I, I will take Clemson to cover the 22 there. All right, don't forget, make sure that you go and enter in the picks contest. It's being held over at runyourpool.com, but you can also just go to winningcureseverything.com and click on contest up at the top. There is a link in the description for it, so hopefully you guys will go and check that out. Enter in the contest. Winner each week gets a $25 Amazon gift card, and you can continue to enter each and every week, and we will have a prize that will be announced here in a few weeks for the season-long winner, whoever has the most picks right against the spread as the season goes along. So go ahead and check that out. It's powered by BetUS. The show is powered by BetUS. They are where the game begins. Make sure that you check it out, BetUS.com. But also check out the BetUS College Football Show as well. Ah, Everybody, it's going to be a fantastic weekend. I really appreciate you for being here. Thank you for checking out the show. Oh, I will be on with uh, ESPN 1000's Jonathan Hood up in Chicago on Friday as well. So make sure that you check that out. Uh, You can just follow my Twitter page or Twitter profile or whatever, at GaryWCE, uh, to figure out exactly when I will be on with him talking about some of the big-time matchups as well. But yes, I am excited, and I hope you are too. It's going to be a fantastic full weekend. Sunday morning, back here again, 9.30 a.m. Central, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I cannot wait to recap and react to all of the action that has happened between Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So hopefully you guys are ready as well. All right, with that said, we're getting out of here. You guys, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully... All of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.